So we'll, we'll read it together. It's on the screen. I'm hoping it's on the screen. Yep, here we go. <coughs> Psalm 19. If you've got a Bible or you've got it on an app on your phone, have a look at it together. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, in keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive me my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. How about we pray and then we're going to look at that psalm together. Father God, thank you for your word today. Thank you that uh, we can be here together. Thank you for the opportunity to be back at North Coast for me as well. And I pray that together we will uh, see your greatness in this psalm uh, as we look through these greatest hits, the songbook of Israel. I pray that it will raise a song in our hearts as well. Amen. Well, it is the greatest hits, uh, the book of Psalms, and uh, I, I listened uh, to a bit of the introduction that uh, Dan put on his last week, and uh, I don't think I can match going through the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s, and noughties of music, but I actually watch a few reaction videos where sort of generally young black rappers from the hood discover 1970s rock music, and guess what? They like it. They actually like it, and it's emotional. It's actually emotional watching these young guys who have only ever listened to rap, uh, watching uh, people perform great hits from the 70s. Now, there's some rubbish from the 70s as well, but there's some really good stuff. But, and, and they're like, hey, I, I heard that riff in an ad, but I never realized it was a whole song. And you're going, oh, my goodness. And, and now that I have, it's like amazing. And... and the Psalms is a little bit like that, I think, uh, the book of Psalms, because it's the praise and worship songbook of ancient Israel from way back before 1970 even, if you can imagine a time before 1970, millennials here. And the thing is, it's full of bangers, isn't it? And, but we can be a, a little bit like the reaction video dudes. I heard that riff or I've heard that line from the Psalms, but not the whole song. And uh, now that I have heard the whole song, it just opens it up. It just changes things totally. And Psalm 19 is one of those psalms. You may have heard the riff before as it begins. The heavens declare the glory of God. And then as with all songs that you don't know the rest, you do da 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 or fill in the blank. The heavens declare the glory of God. But could you then go on to finish what it actually says? Well, today we get the chance to do it because we maybe don't know the rest of it and, and how it goes. But it's not just an intellectual exercise today or a lesson in musical history or even our version of a reaction video. This psalm, above any of the other psalms, gives us a complete total picture of God that covers all bases from big to small in a, in a deeply satisfying way. And once you hear it, you'll want it on high rotation on spiritual Spotify, let me tell you. So what do I mean by it? What's, what's this psalm doing? Well, it's, it goes, it's, it's amazing in, in its scope. That's what I want to say today. So maybe you're here today with a big existential question about God and life. You feel very small. There's so many big issues. And the way things are going in life, you look at the planet, the way it's going. And the question is, for you, is, is God big enough, grand enough to have this? Has God got this? 
Has he got me in the middle of this? Do I even matter in the middle of all this? What's going on? So maybe that's you today, the existential question about the big stuff. Or maybe, it's, uh, maybe you're here today and you're, you're not particularly religious, but there's a religious question. You're here today and it is a religious place in the sense that it's a church. And the question for you might be, does the God of the Bible make sense to our world today? Now, could I become a Christian? Or maybe for you at the moment, it's could I stay a Christian and trust that this God can make sense of the crazy culture I live in and help me to live and navigate all the stuff that's going on? Does, does God make sense across? So there's the up, the big existential question, and then there's the across. Is this livable? Is this stuff livable as a Christian? But maybe your struggle is deeper than that. Maybe it's not up so much or across, but maybe it's inside. Maybe it's deep pain, hidden problems, shame, loneliness. Can God know me better than I know myself? And if he does, would he still want to be anywhere near me and still want to love me, given what I know about myself. Well, I think Psalm 19 covers all those bases in a beautiful way. It's what makes it a banger. Because in Psalm 19, this is what we get. We get a universal God, the big stuff. A particular God, God in a time and a place working through a people, the church, through the nation of Israel, and then the church, and then a personal God. And the universal God, the, the creator of the cosmos, we, we see in the psalm in verses 1 to 6. And that's the existential question is, is God big enough? <clears throat> and then the particular God is, God's not just the creator of the universe, he's the saviour of a people in verses 7 to 11. And that's the religious question. It, does this stuff work on the ground? And then it gets really deep. The secret place of your heart, the personal God, he's the knower of me, verses 12 to 14. Can God know me and knowing me still want to be with me? So let's have a look at those three stanzas or three uh, verse course verses of, of this uh, greatest hit. Universal God, verses 1 to 6. Now you've probably seen this photograph coming up in every uh, news feed and every uh, online uh, magazine about the universe and these are probably stars, but everything that doesn't have points on it is a galaxy. The James Webb Telescope has given us a view of the universe that we have never seen before. We thought the Hubble Telescope from 15 years ago was doing amazing things, but uh, the James Webb Telescope, has, we've been told, can look back at light from 13 billion years ago in time and show us the vastness of the universe and each of those non-pointy bits is a galaxy. And those photos took people's breath away, even the scientists. And it raised questions about who we are. Why, how did we get here? All these sorts of questions were coming up in the articles that I was reading. And for me, the James Webb moment was a wow God moment. Look at that. But of course, Psalm 19 got there first. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out, out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. Declare and proclaims. Every moment in the universe, way before James Webb, way before Hubble, it turns out that the heavens have been declaring and proclaiming God's glory and work since day dot, the created order has been singing his praises, shouting his glory since it came into being. And perhaps you're saying now, well, well, of course, an ancient religious text was going to say that, but we know better now because of science and all that. And it's interesting that the James Webb scientists are not all reacting by falling prostrate on the floor and going, you are worthy, O Lord, of all honour and praise and glory. Many of them continue in their decidedly non-religious perspective on the universe. And they say, well, the ancients, they were a superstitious lot. 
But I want you to notice something in particular about these, these words, that ancient Israel, alone of all the nations around it, didn't look to the sky and worship the sun, moon, and stars, and planets. Ancients in general, the pagan nations, looked at the vastness, and it was so vast and so amazing that they worshipped the moon, they worshipped the heavenly bodies, but Israel looks at the vastness and worships God. Israel alone of the nations could make a clear distinction between the creator and the created, even when it comes to the poetry of this song. There's absolutely no confusion about it at all. Ancient Israel is set apart from the other nations. It's worth thinking about when you consider that, oh, well, the ancients, they were just superstitious lot. Not the Jewish people at all. And, of course, like all good songs, there's lots of metaphors in this one. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. Like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, flexing, like a champion... I watched the uh, World Athletics Championships over the last few days, and um, if only. And Noah Lyle, a US runner, won the 200 metres, an average speed of 40 kilometres an hour. And as he finished, because he had a zip on his top, he went, I'm not going to do that at the end of this sermon, just to calm your nerves. But it's like, yes! You know, that's what it, flexing. And in one sense, that's what he's saying about this, this coming out like a champion like a bridegroom, like a god. No, not like a god. Never for Israel. So don't dismiss the God of the Bible on the basis that just like all the other pagan nations, we've sort of outgrown him in terms of wisdom and science and modern understanding. Something about the nation of Israel, the people of God, made a clear distinction between the God who created it and the creation itself. Now, I hope you can see the tension, can you? On the premise of this psalm and these words, it would seem that the more and more we know about the universe and the manner in which it is put together, the more and more we should actually worship God. But that's not what's happening, is it? In fact, often we find that to be the exact opposite. The the bigger it seems, the less people care about God. And I recall years ago at a party meeting a friend of mine uh, a brother of a friend of mine who, who wasn't Christian at all, the rest of the family was, and he, and he knew I was studying theology at the time, so this is going back, oh, I don't know, 80 years. And, uh, and, he, and he says, so why do you believe, rocks up like this, why do you believe, look at the universe is so big and so vast, why do you believe anything about God? I said, well, you know, that's the easy question, why don't you believe? You grew up in a Christian family, and he said, oh, I just lived a certain life, and then I got in with a bunch of friends, and in the end, it just all was too hard. I said, so it's actually nothing to do with the size of the universe, and more to do with you wanting to do what you want. He goes, yeah, fair point, and off he walks, and you know, chalk that down to evangelism failure 101, right? But people don't look at the universe and go, wow, God, necessarily. And there's a reason. Is why. If we can get this to move. Whoops, go back one. Here's the verses that I'll read them anyway. It's not coming up. It says this in verses three to four. They have no speech, these created things. They use no word. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth their words to the end of the world. What it's saying is, despite this creation <clears throat> singing its praises to God, you can't hear it. There's no speech, no word, no sound. All the singing by creation in praise of God is of no value to us if we can't hear it. There's a receiver problem. It's as if we're listening in analog, trying to pick up digital sound. That's a great tension. Here is a God, a deeply satisfying, huge God, who, if he did create it all, answers the existential question of meaning and purpose in life. 
You see, if the universe is cold and indifferent and uncreated, then meaning and purpose in our lives are simply constructs of our own desires. And who's to say whose meaning and purpose should trump whose? But if God created it all for something, specifically his praise, his worship, and his glory, then it all matters. But we can't hear it. We can't hear it. (laughs) They have no speech. They use no word. No sound is heard. Yet their voice goes out to the ends of the world. It's a great tension. And the obvious question to ask is, how could the writer of this song come to any different conclusion about God than we have or could, given our lack of being able to hear it? God's power may be vast... He may be more than capable, but how could we know and how could the writer of this song know? You see, it turns out that a commitment to a universal God who's just out there isn't really enough because you'll never arrive at who God is by just looking around the creation. In fact, the Bible says people look at the creation and rather than worship the creator, they worship it. They worship and serve the created things, which is what, hello, Perth. All that good stuff that God has created and we go, it's enough. That can satisfy me from the time I get up to the time I go to bed at night. That's how people operate. You see, we need something more. We need a particular God. In other words, a God who not just is generally there creating the world, but who actually can help us to hear the words that he's saying. This is verses 7 to 11. Now, I remember... Uh, a friend of my parents called Brian, and uh, he's an older guy, and at one stage in my life, I was at uh, the border to, in his house with he and his wife. And I would get up in the morning, and he would be sitting in an armchair with a blanket over his head praying, so no one else in the house was disturbing him before he went off to work. Reading scripture at the table every evening, and a blanket over his head on his armchair praying in the mornings. It was amazing. Now, how did Brian get to that? Did he just resolve to, you know what, I'm going to pray to God every day with a blanket over my head so no one can disturb me. You see, when I first met Brian, I was quite young, with my parents at church where his wife and daughter came to church every week and he didn't. He was a Curtin University academic. And one day, he walked up to my dad in the car park at church and he said, God has saved me. This is a man who had no time for God, who would look at the universe and go, it was just happened. And one day he suddenly is at church and 20 years later he's with a blanket over his head, praying every day, reading the scriptures every day. He did not come to that conclusion through the silent speech of the universe. You see, God revealed himself to Brian in a way that he heard his voice. God spoke to him in a way that we call particular or special revelation, not what we call general revelation, the created order that speaks though we can't hear it. And in order for you, not just Brian, you here today to know God and hear his voice, no amount of wow moments with a James Webb telescope will do it and that's exactly what the song goes on to say God speaks to us in a way that we can hear and in a way that we can respond the law of the Lord is perfect verses 7 refreshing the soul the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy making wise the simple the precepts of the Lord are right giving joy to the heart. What verses 7 to 11 are about are God speaking to people in a specific way. The scriptures, the story of God saving his people, the nation of Israel. This is the story of Israel, the owners of this praise and worship manual. 
And you perhaps know the story if you've been in church a while, that Abraham, who we later find out was an Aramean and they worshipped the moon, God comes to him in Genesis 12 and God speaks to him and says, leave this place and your people and go to a place that I will show you. Abraham wasn't wandering around one day and going, you know what, maybe I should leave this place and go somewhere else. God spoke to him and it changed his life and it set up the salvation plan that God had for Israel and for the world. God speaks and Abraham hears and obeys. And then God reveals himself to Abraham's descendants through the book of Genesis. And then at the start of the book of Exodus, Moses is wandering around and sees a burning bush and God speaks to him and says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. Their cry has come up before me and I'm going to save them. And then through Moses, God takes the children of Israel into the desert through the Red Sea and gives them his laws and his statutes at Mount Sinai. God speaks to his people. And this psalm is a way of talking about that. There are six ways of describing the same thing in these verses. It's poetry. It's the law of the Lord is perfect. The statutes of the Lord, the precepts of the Lord. The song just does what songs do. It describes the same thing in different ways. Laws, statutes, precepts, commands, decrees. It's all the same thing. It's God speaking his word to his people to say, this is what I'm really like. You look at the cosmos and you could go either way because you can't hear it, but I'm going to show you and tell you what I'm actually like. And note the use of the capital L-O-R-D, Lord. That's the term for the saving God of Israel. It's very specific. The start of the psalm says that the heavens declare the glory of God, using a general term for God, but here, the law of the Lord. Very specific. God's general glory is declared in creation, and we can't hear it. God's specific glory is declared in salvation, and we can hear it. And you know what it is? It's glorious. It's not simply what is revealed that counts. It is why it is revealed that counts. It says it. The law of the Lord is perfect. What does it do? It refreshes your soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy. They make stupid people wise. The precepts of the Lord are right. They're a drudgery. No, they give joy to your heart. God is setting up a people and he's sharing his true self to them through his spoken words. And in the scriptures it says that Israel will be a, a, a light to the nations and the rest of the nations will look on and say, what other nation has God revealed himself to who have such wise commands and ways of living? The salvation that God brings to Israel and extension to and extends to us through the gospel, the message of Israel's Messiah King to us today. And it's this message: God is good. His ways are good. When God speaks to us, it's not just about information, it's about transformation. Brian went from being a hard man who was hard on his family to being a gentle godly man who led his family through difficult times because when God speaks it doesn't just inform us it transforms us it transforms us God's good word does God's good work God reveals himself to Israel as saviour by his word for the good of Israel and ultimately for the good of the world. The people of God have been given the opportunity to live lives that are good, true and right because God has spoken to us. He has shown us how to live. And when humans live lives that glorify God, guess what? They're singing in harmony with the universe. If the universe is glorifying God and we're not glorifying God, we're going against the grain. 
God's ways work. A community of God's people praising him and living wise, righteous, pure decisions looks good. Here's what's interesting and perhaps ironic. We have the census data being released and less and less people are ticking Christian. There's been a collapse in Australia over the last 20 years. Now, a lot of that's just people who, you know, it's not like everyone was turning up to church one week and then they weren't. It's just the people went, you know what? I don't believe that. I haven't been to church for years. We've never been. I'm just going to tick no religion. And that's the future. But at a time when Christianity is sort of under the spotlight for all the wrong reasons and people are hassling it out, there's a heart cry from even the most secular people, the journalists and opinion writers in our country, about the breakdown of our lives, socially, sexually, communally, mentally. So the last few weeks I've seen headlines that say things in breathless tones. Couples who don't live together before marriage are more likely to stay married. Whoa, who would have thought? Or consent cannot be the only factor when it comes to sex. Wow, news to me. Or religious communities found to be happier, healthier and live longer. Or faith-based people are more generous with their time and money. You know, it's, it's almost, almost as if living with God's desire for us, according to his word, might work. It's almost as if that's living in with the grain of the universe and it's glorifying of God. And the community of God's people, the church, is at a state where, yes, we are less and less, people are ticking Christian less and less and no religion more and more, but we are going to be a good example of God's good work being enacted through God's good word to a watching world. Even it turns out when it comes to the sheer loneliness, that's one of the scourges of our modern life. In an article in the Sydney Morning Herald yesterday entitled, Not a Single Person Will Talk to You, Why It's So Hard to Make Friends in Sydney. We were in Sydney last week, it was, it was pretty tough. But in this article, newcomer to Sydney after newcomer expresses how much of a struggle it is to strike up a friendship in a city that takes pride in how welcoming it is. And one person said this. What did they say? Put it up, I think. A few times after work, I've stopped into a bar in the city to have a drink, do some work on my laptop. No one, not a single person, will talk to you. Imagine that a city of five and a half million people, and you're lonely. As I said, we were in Sydney last week, and we rocked up to a church where I knew the pastor, but no one else, and he wasn't there yet. And people were busy. It was like kid city, you know, kids everywhere under the age of five. And by rights, everyone should have avoided us, but you know what? We found it hard to take a seat. People came up and asked who we were, where we were from, felt sorry for us when we said we were from Perth, you know, all that. <clears throat> and why Declan, my son, had such great hair and I had none. Well, someone did ask that, but in church, it wasn't lonely because there's something about the community of God that is good, right, and true. Christians are what we call the New Testament people of God to whom God has ultimately revealed himself through his word the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Hebrews chapter 1, it says, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through many and various ways by the prophets. That's God speaking. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son through whom he created everything. Turns out the very creator God, for whom all the creation is worshipping and praising him, is the same God who's the saving God who comes to us in the Lord Jesus. So what are some of God's revealed words in the gospel that will help us be the community that we need to be in this world that makes sense of living in this world? Well, here's some I prepared earlier. What does it say in Scripture? Welcome one another then, just as Christ welcomed you in order to bring glory to God. The law of the Lord is perfect. 
Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you, Ephesians 4. You can't go away from here saying, I don't know how God intends me to treat other people because he hasn't spoken to me to tell me. It's there. It's there. The very words of Jesus. A new commandment I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. All those commands in Psalm 19, precepts, laws, decrees, bottled, summed up in that, a new commandment. The final revealed word of God, the Lord Jesus, gives us the ultimate way to be religious, to love each other as he has loved us. And when did he say that? Just as he was about to give up his life for his disciples on the cross. There's something precious and sweet about the commands of Jesus, isn't there? Something precious and sweet that's preempted in Psalm 19 where it says, what does it say? They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. To live that life in a world which has rejected God will become more precious and more sweet the darker it gets. We can be a community of difference as people take no religion on the next census at an ever-increasing rate. There's also something very important, sobering about these words as well. Something that puts our lives in the balance. And it's the balance between ignoring God's words and heeding God's words. Because what happens when those words and laws of God become less precious to you, when you find that other things are more tasty in your life, And this could be where you are this morning. By them, your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. See, Psalm 19 gives a warning and a rewarding. Do not neglect to hear the voice of God. And a sure sign that you are is that other things become more precious and more sweet to you. And it dials down the voice of God in your life. And it dials up other beguiling voices. And this verse is a hinge verse to our final section. And it's the part of the song that goes deep, deeper than we thought possible. Because we've had the universal God who creates everything and the particular God who saves a people, Israel, and through that, the world and the church. But there's the personal God who knows us individually. The warning in the word of God offsets the reward and holds it in tension. Because what would be worse than never hearing the voice of God at at all? Seeing the creation and you you can't tune in because it's analog and it's digital. What would be worse than that? I think this would be worse. Hearing it and turning away from it having those words revealed to you, but eventually rejecting them. It says this in Hebrews. It does. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, lest, or so that, we do not drift away. A universe singing the Creator, God's glory, a nation writing the praise and worship songbook to the Saviour God's worth, yet it's still possible to block our ears and let other things be more beguiling and beautiful in their song to us and drift away. And that's where this song goes for our personal God. You see, we live in a psychological age, don't we? We live in the life of the interior self where we're always thinking about ourselves from an internal perspective looking out. But that's actually not so far removed from the experience of this songwriter. 
It's very, very personal. This song goes from creation to the nation to the heart. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive me my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule or have dominion over me. Hidden faults and willful sins. The things that we don't know we're doing that are wrong and the things we go, you know what, I'm just going to step into that. The things we can't even see in ourselves that others have to point out to us. The things that we can't even figure out, we can bring to this God. He's that personal. He knows our very psychology and he can help us in the midst of us. And those willful sins, those addictions that threaten to rule your life, bring them to him as well. Because he already knows them. <laughs> There's never an audience of one. The God who rules the universe can keep those sins from ruling your heart and ruining your life by the power of his transforming Holy Spirit. And if you're struggling today with deeply personal stuff, know that we have a God who goes deeper and more personal and therefore more transformative than any psychologist could ever enable you to be. Or if you're teetering on the edge of a sin that would rule over you, don't drift from Jesus. Bring your sins to the Saviour King. And if that's for the first time today, and if you're not a Christian today, and you know your heart, you know the stuff that would repulse others, never mind you, repulses you, then our King offers forgiveness and the power to change. That's how personal this Creator God goes. Incredible. And here's how it finishes. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Do you notice how this song ends? It comes full circle like so many great songs. What starts with a silent universe glorifying God that no one can hear finishes with audible worship from us. And that's only right when we realize who the true God is. When we see his creation wonder, his saving wonder, and the very wonder that he understands the depths of my heart. What is left but to raise our voices in praise? Because if we don't, if we don't sing it out loud, one day the creation will. <laughs> and perhaps you're sitting here today unmoved and unwilling to sing the praise of a great creator, saviour, such as our God, and you are unmoved by him and his glory. But bear in mind, at some stage, something will take up the slack. As Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, where he is to be crucified, the hands that flung stars into space to cruel nails surrendered, his followers are singing his praises as he enters the city to the shock and disgust of the religious leaders who hate him. And they say, rebuke your disciples. Stop them worshipping and praising you. And how does Jesus respond? I tell you, if they keep quiet, the very stones will cry out. I don't think it means the rolling stones. Classic rock though they be. But one day, those who refused to join in the glorious song of the created universe will be astonished to hear the very rocks on the ground lift their voices to praise Jesus. All creation will one day declare his glory in the most audible voice possible. And 13 billion years will seem like a speck in light of eternity. If you haven't started praising him yet, 
wouldn't today be a great day to do that? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much that you, the creator God, became our saviour God and are a deeply personal God. You know our intimate thoughts. You know the sin in our hearts. Yet the Lord Jesus came and died for us. The King of glory, the creator God, became our saviour God. And by your power of his spirit is transforming us to live lives dedicated to your praise and glory. And may we lift our voices now to sing your praise in response to what we've heard. Amen.